Okay, so um, I'd just first of all like to thank Hannah for inviting us to come and speak at the event and it's really great to be <coughs> with you all today to share some of the things that we've been working on. Um, this, this, uh, we're going to talk to you today about a serious case review that we um, were asked to uh, conduct on behalf of the Safeguarding Board uh, in Cumbria, so that's what we're here for. But before we do that, we'd just like to introduce ourselves. So my name is David Blackwell and I'm the Chief Executive at People First. Um, my background is in psychotherapy, that's what I trained in a number of years ago, but I've been working at People First for about 17 years now uh, with Lou. Uh, Lou's watched me grow up uh, from, from being a student, uh, yes. uh, leaving school yes. uh, to, to now. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I started working as a support worker and have worked my way through the organisation. Um, at the moment, the kind of work that I'm involved with is uh, we also we run Health Watch in Cumbria. Um, and people first do a whole range of things which Lou's going to tell you about in a moment. Mm -hmm. But um, So I'm involved uh, much more in kind of leadership and management roles now. Um, I sit, sit on the, um, the System Leadership Board which uh, runs the NHS in Cumbria, uh, the Health and Wellbeing Board, the Safeguard and Adults Board and so on. So uh, the role is quite strategic um, in its nature at the moment but that mean, d doesn't mean to say that we don't do lots of amazing work across lots of projects and so on which we're going to describe today. Mm -hmm. Lou. Hi, um, I'm Lou, uh, and um, I'm from People First also. I've been involved in People First for 24 years now, um, and I've done a variation of jobs since I started. Uh, I was a women's coordinator for three years. We got three years funding for that, so that was actually a paid, you know, a fully uh, fledged paid job that was. Although I still get paid for the work I do now, uh, it was, um, you know, it was uh, very different. I've been a project director of um, People First in Carlisle. Um, I've done admin jobs, secretarial jobs, um, the fina finance, um, watching the finances. Currently, I'm a director of People First now, currently. Um, I also um, do a lot of work, or I have done, at University of Manchester um, on their um, learning, disabilities, um, learning Disabilities course. I was a, a visiting lecturer there. And um, <coughs> that work's trailed off a little bit now, unfortunately. I was involved in the social work uh, degree uh, doing some lecturing at the <coughs> University of Cumbria as well. Um, now, I'm also, um, I've also been involved in editing um, and writing chapters for various publications, one of which was, is called um, uh, Relationships and Sexuality in the Lives of People with Learning Disabilities. That can be found on Amazon. So just give it a look there. Okay, well, right, we must move on. So, um, um, very lastly, I'm involved in the CTR, so uh, care and treatment of youth as well. I do a lot of that work. So we're going to tell you a little bit about People First. So, Luke, do you want to describe some of the projects that People First yes. currently deliver? Yes. Currently, we deliver advocacy for um, any vulnerable person. So we. Um, provide the Care Act advocacy, advocacy for, um, for children and young people, um, uh, NHS complaints, and um, <coughs> Okay. We also provide uh, help of Cumbria, like I've said. We've got a research and education department, which is led by Dr. Ross Chapman. Uh, we've got a health, uh, mental health forum, that we, forums that we run across um, the, uh, the county of Cumbria. And we've got two exciting new projects. We've got something called the Best Life Program, which is a program for people who learn the club is all around living their best life. It's a new venture for us. And we're about to open a, a conference centre in Cumbria, um, which is going to be run by people with learning difficulties who will be part of a hospitality academy. So that's yes. a, a new venture that we're it it's, it's quite a large undertaking, really. It is, yeah. Um, and it's going to be really good, uh, just very quickly, because for me, I think personally, Rather than having people just stuck in the day centre uh, where they maybe don't want to be, they're going to be like um, apprentices and hopefully either get a job in our organisation at the end of it 
or a job elsewhere. So it'd be like working in the kitchen, or on the reception, or uh, hosting, just whatever. Yeah, okay, so um, one of the things that we, uh, one of the things I'm sure you know quite a lot about is, is about the, um, the, the premature deaths of people with learned difficulties. I'm sure it doesn't make any of us feel very good when we hear some of the facts that I'm about to, to share with you. The two kind of substantive pieces of work that have been done around this was Menkhaup's death by indifference report, which was, I mean, it seems like yesterday, but it was actually in 2007 that that was done. And more recently, there's the confidential inquiry into the premature deaths of people who only put it. We call that a cycle for sure. Um, that was 2013. So here's some facts from that report. So it said, the review said that 37% of the deaths of people who learned difficulties were avoidable. Uh, that men died 30, men who learned difficulties died 13 years earlier than the general population. That women who learned difficulties died 20 years earlier. And only 38% uh, of deaths were reported to the coroner, and that's set against 46% uh, of the general population. Mm. So, uh, you yeah, know, that doesn't read too well, does it? Well, it doesn't really, because it's like, oh, it's a, a death of a person with a learning difficulty, let's just sweep it under the carpet. So, um, the, the, basically, the end result of the cycle report said that the quality and effectiveness of health and social care. Um, given to people who learned it, but it was deficient in a number of ways. That was a kind of summary of my view. Um, so, we're part of the, uh, I'm part of the Adult Safeguarding Board, and uh, we were asked to conduct a, a safeguarding adult review uh, into the life of Judy Ben. Uh, so, this is Judy and her family, and we're going to spend the rest of the time talking to you about her today. This is a really different um, safeguarding review. Um, it was a significant incident learning process. Uh, and obviously there's a list of uh, different types of processes that you can uh, carry out. But the Care Act gave us more freedom to carry out reviews in a slightly different way, and that's what we've tried to do with this review. One of the fundamental differences, of course, is that you can... Uh, we, we, we're using the name uh, of the lady that died. We've got permission to do that, which is wonderful, because it allows us to tell a real story, rather than Mr. X or Mrs. X. Or, uh, so, on. so what we're going to try and do today is really bring you this story to life and to tell you what happened to her. So I'm going to talk about that, um, but also what the learning does. I'm going to ask you to reflect on the story and possible points where things could have been done differently, um, and, and also what the role of the social worker could have been. Um. Is there any chance we can get some water? Um, so yes, there's a significant incident uh, in, in fact, sorry, a significant incident of learning process that we've done with the silly. So the things that we tried to do in terms of this approach was we wanted to be fully inclusive. So we put together a team of people uh, to, to kind of lead the process. We asked Lou to come in as an expert by experience. Um, and we had Dr. Ross Chapman help yes. us. So, so the three of us all put the report. Yeah. There's some people here that are in the room actually. Just look at one uh, as we can do the review, which is really nice to see. Oh, so. um, we wanted to keep Judy at the centre of the work. Um, that was really important to us. So right from the outset, we were absolutely you know, keen on making sure that we understood who Judy was, what was important to her about her life. And uh, on the day of the review, we had pictures everywhere of Judy, all around the room, so that actually, rather than talking about a situation or a case, we were talking about a person, what was really important to her in her life. Mm. Obviously, the focus was not on the it was on understanding what the learning could be. We tried to work with openness and honesty with all of the organisations involved, and there was a whole host of organisations involved. We've brought the report with us, and I've got copies, so please come and see me if you'd like a copy, uh, and I can see the full detail, obviously. Um, we wanted to include the important people in Judith's life, so we offered Judith's family the chance to talk to us. They, they wanted to do that, but they didn't want to be involved with the review, so we conducted interviews with them prior to the review taking place. We wanted to be respectful of all parties involved uh, and respect all of the views that came to the, to, to the front review. And uh, we wanted the review to be an active review. We didn't want anyone to be passive whatsoever. We didn't want people sat in a room and just listening and being there. Mm. We wanted people to actually take part. So, Judy Ben, let me tell you a little bit about Judy. So, Judy was born on the 17th of July in 1959, uh, and she was 54 years old when she died. She lived happily with her family until the age of 11. 
Um, well, this is when her mother, Jean and Gordon, made the agonising decision that they could no longer care for her. And at that time, she uh, was moved into Duffinby Hall Hospital, which is the local institution uh, at the time in, in Cumbria. She lived there until 1997. She had great relationships with her family. So, other things about Judy, she loved slapstick comedy. She was said to have a wicked and filthy sense of humour. Um, and there was a story that we heard about Judy, which was about how she used to embarrass her twin sister's boyfriends when they would come round by making interesting gestures and focusing on the sexual side of their relationship. Um, Judy could have good and bad days like us all. A good day for Judy was her full of sparkle and light and energy. A bad day, she wouldn't want anybody to do it. Um, Judy had taken the death of her mother and father really badly. One, and a really important point in this, in this case, uh, in Judy's story, is that she didn't verbally communicate, but she could let us know what her feelings were. She would do this by, develop, she developed her own style of communication. So she would rub her stomach and point at her teeth if she was in pain, and things like that, lots of other things, but that was one of the ways she could. And she started to clap her hands as well. She clapped her hands to mean no. So yes. of, um, that's how she told us that she didn't want to do something. Mm. Um, her health was described as good just a few weeks before her death. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to kind of tell you, talk you through the story. Now, what I, this is not a passive presentation. I want you to really pay attention because as we go through at the end of the session, we're going to ask you to think about when could something different have happened. Mm -hmm. That's a really important part of this. So I'm going to talk about the last four days of Judy's life, and it gets quite rapid towards the end, things are changing quite quickly. So I really want you to think about what could have happened, what professional intervention could have changed the course of action for Judy. So we know Judy was 54, uh, she didn't verbally communicate, and it was deemed that she lacked the capacity around medical treatment. So medication was given in Judy's best interest. She had a long history of bowel problems and constipation. This is something that had been with her right away through all. Judy's mother had died of a twisted hernia. In September 2013, Judy had a chest x-ray and it was noted that she had a distended core. Judy had lost weight recently, but she'd been unhealthy since then. On the 20th of April 2014, Judy's sister visited her, Judy's twin sister Liz. She'd taken Judy out to the seaside for the day. But they ate chips and ice cream. They had a brilliant day. And Judy's sister got back and said to the staff in the house that Judy was the best she'd seen her in a long time. In the next few days, Judy's condition changed rapidly. On Thursday, the 24th of April, Judy was very constipated. She was unable to walk or talk. She had nine sachets of Mubicon, which is a medication that you use when you have constipation as an issue. And that had been ordered by the Amateur Bowers Doctors Service, uh, which in Cumbria is called CHOP. I don't know what it's called. It's uh, Judy was shouting out in pain. She had not vomited. The district nurses had been and had assessed her bowels, and they told the staff to continue with Mubicol and to give her two paracetamol. So that was, that was Thursday. On Saturday, the 26th of April, Judy was still constipated, nothing had changed. She was disorientated with pain. The movie call appeared not to be working. The staff had called the CHOC service, the Outbound Doctor's Service, and they'd been told to increase, increase the movie call to six sessions and to review the following day and call them back if needed. On Sunday, the next day, the 27th of April, the staff, which were, worked for an organisation called United Response, I'll take this time to say the United Response staff in the coroner's inquest held up has been absolutely outstanding. The compassion that they've used and, and the kind of way that they've cared for Judy was, was kind of really held up as great properties. But the United Re Response staff um, were still really concerned. Judy was constipated, shouting out her pain in pain, agitated. They called the CHOC service at 12.15.04 and had a 13 minute consultation over the telephone. They were advised to take a movie call every two hours until Judy's 
file was put them. They were told to contact the GP on Monday morning. District nurses would come and give an enema, and at 3 o'clock that day they arrived and attempted to give the enema. Judy refused. She didn't like medical intervention. She didn't like people she didn't know. Um, at that time, the nurses had felt her stomach, and it was described as really hard, and to continue to move the colon paracetamol. Monday the 28th of April, uh, staff are very concerned. Judy still not opened her bodies. So this is now several days later. Uh, they ran the medical practice and it was agreed that a home visit would take place. But no time was given for the home visit. At 5.30, the doctor visited and queried a bowel obstruction. Judy's bowels had not at that time been opened in five days and it was agreed that a hospital admission was the right thing to do. At uh, 7.30 that evening, the service manager called an ambulance because Judy's condition had worsened. The ambulance was booked and they were told it could take four hours for it to arrive. They were told, if the situation changed, to call for an emergency ambulance on 999. At 8.10 that night, the emergency ambulance arrived. Um, sorry, at 8.10 the emergency ambulance was called. At 8.50 it arrived. Judy was anxious and she was not letting the paramedics anywhere near. Judy became more stressed and more anxious. It was noted at that time that diazepam had been used in the past when they needed to intervene with Judy and give her some support. Um, so it was agreed that they would ask the CHOP out of our service to come and give some sedation to Judy so that she could be taken into the ambulance uh, and into hospital. The ambulance would then return and the admission and they would admit it directly to the ward or they'd have to go through AD. At 10 o'clock at night, Chop called the house to say that a doctor was coming to give medication and to give the sedation. Um, additional staff were brought in by the service provider because they knew they would have to support Judy to go to hospital. Um, it was noted at this time, importantly, that the hospital was on postcode, uh, postcode alert, which for us, we didn't really know what that meant when you and I started the review. Mm -hmm. Basically, what it means is that some of the ambulances from certain postcodes in our area, area are diverted to another hospital, only, only for certain conditions on certain departments and wards. So it was, it was noted uh, in, in, in the notes that we reviewed that there was a postcode alert on. At uh, half, half past uh, 12 that evening, Chop visited and they tapped Judy away. Um, Judy was said to be mesmerised by the doctor, that was the word that we used. Mm. She was calm when she was in bed, bearing in mind this time she, she'd been calling out of pain for several, several days. Um, an examination of the ab abdomen was, was uh, able to happen then, and it was described as full and firm, but not visibly distended. And a rectal examination happened as well, and there was no tenderness noted. During, during the examination, Judy passed gas. And, uh, and so it was thought at that point that it was not likely to be an obstruction. The doctor gave a micro enema because that's all he had in his car. And he decided that there was a decision made that a district nurse would come and give a full enema in due course. Uh, Judy would not be, this was the decision of the doctor at the time, Judy would not be given a sedation. She was not going to be going to a hospital. As the hospital had closed its doors to admissions, that's what was written in the notes. The symptoms did not qualify for admission. There was no intestinal obstruction and there was a, a heated discussion between the support staff in the house and the doctor. The doctor stated that he could not justify any more time on constipation. The doctor called his superior because he knew the staff were really unhappy about this. Um, and his, his thinking was confirmed by his superior. So he called up the doctor who was in charge and his thinking was confirmed at that time. No vital signs were taken <coughs> during the examination. Tuesday, so this is after the end, Tuesday the 29th of April, 2.30am, 2, 2 the district nurse arrived at the house. The house was described as chaotic over these few days. Judy was screaming in pain, Judy lived with two or three other people, their levels of anxiety were building, staff were really at their wits end by this point. Um, so, so at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, the, the district nurse had arrived, but Judy was asleep and there was an agreement made not to wake her. 
The nurse would call back in the morning and, uh, and take a look at you. At 9.30 the, in the morning, the learning disability nurse, nursing team were called for advice. And their advice was to arrange for the GP uh, to come and visit and to plan an emergency admission to hospital. At 10.30, a diazepam prescription was faxed over to the pharmacy so the staff of the house were affected. At 12.30, staff gave the medication to you. At 12.45, an ambulance arrived. And at 2 o'clock, Judy was admitted to hospital. She was taken straight to a surgical assessment unit. Her oxygen levels were very low. She was given fluids, and staff stayed with her during the whole of this process. At 4.15 that afternoon, Judy was assessed. Her blood pressure had dropped considerably. She had, there was a notable deterioration in her condition. And her, blood, her, white blood cell, her, her white blood count was very low and it was decided or it seemed that she was in sepsis. Um, no intervention could happen at this point. She was gravely, described as gravely unwell and far too unwell for surgery. At 4.30, Judy's family were called, and at 5.30, the staff were asked for medical history from Judy, about Judy by hospital staff and doctors. At this point, the staff were told that Judy probably wouldn't survive. Judy's brother arrived, uh, David, who travelled from Yorkshire. Um, he got there as quickly as he could. And at 8.40 that night, Judy died at the Cumberland in Birmingham. That was the 29th of April. I'm sure you all sat there feeling more weird about what used to be an awful and yeah, yeah. Pr pretty horrendous yeah. kind of story. Yeah. Um, so, what we'd like you to do is we now need to think about what do we learn from that situation yeah. because otherwise if we don't take some time to reflect as practitioners um, that, that was all wasted, the whole, the whole duties kind of last four days was a waste day no. So what we'd like you to do is, is To look at, we've um, got a question haven't we? Yeah. Um, what could or should have happened differently that might have changed the outcome? And just, I'll just read this to you, this is what the coroner said in the inquest and this is why we were asked to do the review as a, an organisation that was kind of passionate about the lives of people who learned from The coroner said, the concern is that a person with severe learning difficulties and 24-hour professional care died of a treatable complaint, notwithstanding telephone contact with doctors on three separate occasions, two home visits by district nurses, one by a paramedic, and two personal attendances by different general practitioners, all within the space of less than three days. So that was a comment from the coroner's report. Uh, that was coroner David Roberts. So to the question, which you said, can you, what could and should have happened differently for Judy? Can you take yes. a little bit of time and we'll call you back together yes. and take some feedback? So we're going to take some feedback. Is there any questions first, first of all? Any quick questions about the, uh, the Judy's story? Would anyone like to know? Anything else? We might not be able to answer, but we'll try. So, so the cause of death was was that Judy died of a twisted bowel. So, uh, um, which obviously um, then her bowel started to die. Uh, and, and when we were kind of going through all of the, the the coroner's notes and so on, there was lots of medical professionals involved um, giving evidence. But they'd said up until a certain point. Um, the bowel absolutely could have been saved mm. uh, with a very simple procedure. Mm. Um, but, but obviously, you know, once it hit a certain point, the bowel had started to die, and at that point, you know, then there was there was nothing that could have been done. Uh, even had Judy got to the hospital a bit earlier uh, than she did, there was still nothing that could have been done. I mean, I think this for me is the starkest mm. uh, statement of all, um, and the very reason that we were asked to um, to carry out the review. Really. Yeah. So there's a question over here, and then we'll take some feedback, please. Can you have a chance to clarify? At the very beginning, did you have a long really how could, if she had an social worker, improve the situation? Did you have that to um, we, that's a, the second question that we're going to ask this afternoon, so we're going to, we're going to talk about that a bit later on if we've got time. So. Right, that's okay. Yeah. We were just thinking, lots of medical issues there, but... There are lots of medical issues, you're right, yeah. yeah. I guess... You know, we need to be looking at people really holistically, though. So, um, you know, I think that's right. But I think 
you know, one of the things that we looked at was, was is there a need for a health advocate? Who's, who's advocating for people's health? Um, and does that need to be a medical professional or should it be somebody who knows the individual very well? So, okay, let's, we'll take some feedback if possible. So let's talk about when things could have been done differently and let's just have a discussion about it. So if you can raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you and let's talk about the times that things could have been done differently. Over at the front here. You know, so she had nine before the intervention, then she was advised to take six, and then she was advised to take them every two hours until her bowels open. So, you know, count the number of hours that have gone by, that's a lot of movie calling. Indeed. Being, uh, happening there. So you're right, so an earlier intervention there would have been really helpful. I think it was through, through one of trying, and tried on two separate occasions, I think there was, for nurses to come and give enemies, but that hadn't worked because, of course, Judy didn't like intervention, she didn't like people she didn't know, she was in a lot of pain, people couldn't get near her to kind of do that thing as well, that was one of the issues. Okay? I know you mentioned at some point Judy didn't have the sandwich that she didn't have capacity, I suppose as a social care practitioners what we have to do is record mental capacity, lack, lack of mental capacity or how we run mental capacity assessment and then you have to go through a best interest process mm -hmm. and decision making process. What I found with many health professionals is that they're actually quite out of tune with the Mental Capacity Act and the best interest principles. So I just was interested whether or not these decisions were, there was just a blanket duty as a got capacity, but there wasn't actually a formal process gone through, which would have maybe included social care in terms of the <coughs> It's a really important point. When we come to our recommendations or our findings, we'll talk a lot more about mental capacity there because for, it's obviously a big glaring kind of uh, gap in people's knowledge and understanding, I think. Okay, other points over here. I just wondered if there's any possible that trying to fix the problem with the constipation a few years earlier before this happened and trying to intervene maybe four or five years earlier to stop this from happening to us often because the is quite a painful thing, so maybe we fixed it sooner. This yeah, to I think you're absolutely right. So there, there wasn't a coherent plan in place in the um, So I think um, Judy had a lot of contact with her GP. She had a very good relationship with the GP practice. That was working very effectively. So they were, you know, there was a plan in place for this. Um, but obviously the plan, you know, in this particular uh, instance didn't, didn't, didn't kind of bear fruit. So. Okay, back up in front of back. Um, you said that the mother had been called when it was sort of deemed that she wouldn't live. Was there no other family member called before then? That was the first call to the family member on the day, that, you know, two or three hours before she died. And Judy's, so let me tell you a little bit about Judy's family. So Judy's brother is a social worker and Judy's sister is uh, a mental health nurse. Um, and that's why they were so keen for us to share Judy's, Judy's story and use her name and pictures because they were incensed by lots of the things that happened in this situation. So, uh, yeah, that was the first contact. Uh, yeah. and her brother lived in Yorkshire, Judy lived in Cumbria, and her sister lives in Guernsey. So, yeah, um, and one thing her sister did say, which I think you mind me, David, was that, um, why weren't people more curious? Hmm. She talked, Judy's sister talked about a professional curiosity yes. that she felt was missing all the way through this situation. Why were people not asking more questions? You know, we're trained, we know stuff. We should just be more inquisitive about what's going on here. Okay, another point at the back there. Yeah, I just wondered um, if Julie didn't like any, anybody that she didn't know. Surely a family member, her sister, that she was obviously very close to, may have been the perfect point of call to sort of be able to read what 
the signs that she was showing and maybe to calm her down if that's what she needed. I mean, I think essentially there was a lack of an emergency plan. So, um, so, so it was known, it was widely known that Judy wouldn't like, you know, didn't like medical interventions. It didn't like going, certainly didn't like going to the hospital. It needed lots of planning, but there was no plan in place for 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 if that was if there was an emergency situation. It just hadn't been talked about. No. Okay, over at the back. Do you, do you know? Do you know what she had? So, so, so this is, we'll come back to our recommendations, but one of the things is all of those things were in place, but nobody asked for them and nobody shared them. Um, and, you know, uh, it was importantly, I said at the end there, that it was at 5.30 on the day of her death when the staff were asked for a medical history. So that was after several days worth of, you know, all of those health professionals been involved. And I mean, we're not looking to blame here. That's not the point. This is not absolutely not about the blame. But, but I, I think one of the other things that's really interesting is that each one of these um, people were involved in a, in a kind of episodic nature. So they came in, and I'm the, I'm the on-call doctor, and I come and I, and I deal with this. And then I, my shift finishes, and then I'm off. And then the next day it's back to the GP because it's a Monday. And then the next day the district nurse comes, but she's never met Judy before. So, you know, and then the next nurse that comes has also never met Judy before, and that's in the middle of the night. It's a night shift, and it's, you know, so it's lots of professionals, none of whom knew Judy very well. Uh, and there's a really important point there because there's something about the people that know Judy best not been listened to. Yeah. Why weren't they? Two, two things, and we'll come to this in our findings, but why weren't they believed? Why weren't they advocated more strongly? Yeah. Why weren't, you know, so there's something we, we wrote into our findings that we felt it was really important that support workers in houses are empowered to become advocates, really strong, assertive advocates for people. And it's, I mean, I think it's fair to say they did that. They, you know, that the coroner said that the care that she received and the compassion was, was really outstanding. So, Oh, sorry. Why did it take ages to ask the family history when they did it in the first place? Good point. Yeah, that was the first time on the last day, wasn't it, that, that, that was asked for. Yeah. It's a really good point. If the um, if the now the like before I would have come to the office to provide the information. Yeah. That's right. I mean, I think that's, the, that's absolutely the point, is that had, we, had things happened differently, then Judy would yeah. definitely still be here. That's why the coroner was so upset that it was a treatable condition, really similar to solve <coughs> condition. Yes. Over at the back there, Kath. Okay, Fellow really Cumbrian. <laughs> yeah. Whilst you um, said that um, the coroner had found um, the care provider to be um, blameless, and I'm not arguing that the were in a way, but what I am suggesting is why didn't they contact the family when obviously they knew Judy was unwell, so why didn't they contact the family as soon as they knew she was unwell, um, and why didn't they just take it away me as, as soon as rather than wait for three days before that happened if they were so concerned? Just Okay. Really good points, Kath. I, I couldn't agree more. So, uh, whilst the coroner did, you know, kind of commend the staff for their compassion, um, you know, that certainly doesn't mean to say that there's not things that they should have and could have done differently. I think that's absolutely right. Yes. Okay. Any other points that we could have altered, Lorraine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just. We have a specialist um, team, community facility team in Cumbria. And what I want to know is because they, they, had, um, they have a health pathway and one assumes that you know, the, you know, the sort of health of, of Judy was kind of, they were involved. I, I just wondered where, where they felt, they sat, where did they sit in that? In terms of, do you mean the, the LD? Yeah, in terms of the co coordination because it, it, it is an issue around the lead health professional role, the lack of coordination 
and and you know I would have probably I'm just I'm just asking that question really. I think, I think there's a distinct lack of coordination. That's one of the main points here, is that nobody was in that role. And um, again, pe people weren't actively involved, so there, you know, there, there wasn't a social worker that was actively working with Judy, because everything was nice and quiet. Um, and you know, she was just being supported at home and nothing was really happening. Everything was just going fine. And of course, um, you know, so, so I don't, she didn't have a named social worker in, 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 in as far as we can make out. And from a health point of view, I think the learning disability nursing team at the time worked in a very similar way. You know, Judy was not somebody that was kind of in regular contact with them. She was, you know, being supported well at home. Um, so. Just a couple of things about um, she's been experiencing participation for quite a long time. There's two things. One, has she been, have, she's been having a GP annual health check? Should have picked that up. And did the house have a kind of healthy eating exercise plan to reduce the constipation rather than endless mood problem? Yeah. But certainly there was a healthy eating plan, I said that, but so Judy had lost, you know, she'd, gone, she'd lost a lot of weight recently. So she'd gone from a size 18 to a size 14 or something over a number of months. Uh, but that was absolutely a, a drive from the staff in the, in the house to support Judy to eat more healthily. Um, the problem with the bowel was, was known. It was very well known by the GP, by her sister. Her sister had raised concerns about it several months earlier because she was concerned about the masses of laxatives that Judy was uh, using. Um, it didn't change anything. You know. Okay, so there's, there's lots of points where things could have been, been done differently. There's, we could have gone on all afternoon because there's all kinds of things. Um, in terms of the role of the named social worker, um, it, can we just spend maybe five minutes, just really quickly? Lou, do you want to? Yes, yeah, five minutes um, on what do we think um, the name social worker could have done as well? Yeah, the, yeah, so if the role of the name social worker was operating well, yeah. and we were seeing better social work, what kinds of things might have been going on, or how think, could things have been a bit different? Just five minutes on that, please. Um, so this is us asking you to think about the name of the, uh, the, the, sorry, the role of the name social worker. What do you think? Any thoughts about how social, the role of the social worker could be involved here, could have made a difference? Why are we not picking up on this? Why were they not picking up on them? Has she got any allergies? Does she need a dietitian? All these things, all those years ago, then maybe we would come to this in the beginning. So maybe not necessarily name social work, but just better social work practice. Mm -hmm. Better social work, working together as a team, asking those questions, picking up yeah. things in order to get that information. Do you, to quote Judy's sister, that professional curiosity. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's, that's the word she used on that. <laughs> If she had um, some continuous care, like a main social worker, they could have worked out like a crisis plan, you know, so they could have some steps to take if this happened, you know, um, something like that. There was, there was a discussion uh, which was about could, could the service keep some diazepam, um, you know, in, in their drugs cabinet or what have you, in case this happened, and there was all kinds of reasons why that was deemed not to be the thing to do. Um, but 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 you're right. Some kind there was there, w there was no plan in place for for an emergency, um, which was obviously uh, a, a big problem in this situation. I think you said a moment that the uh, doctor and a 
sex and said that she didn't fit the criteria. Um, and we agreed that maybe Indian social worker could have been then challenged um, that analysis that was given. I think you mentioned that the staff and the doctor had a complete discussion at one point. Mm -hmm. Maybe they, with a named social worker, they may have provided a little bit more um, information, provided a bit more um, confidence, uh, which may have led to being admitted into the hospital. See you soon, yeah. 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 <laughs> I think, it, I think it is. I think it's a shame. It shows that there's quite a lot of systemic how people with learned disabilities are are sometimes treated within within the health within as when they're accessing health services. And I think it is. You know, I agree that it's about social work, good social work practice, not necessarily um, a named social worker. Because I think you know you could have had a named social worker who may have actually done may have not made any difference at all because they didn't have the you know they it do, does depend on the professional i feel and how much they feel confident in their own abilities to challenge yeah. and you know to be able to make those decisions but i think it is about building good social work practice thank you any final points okay a couple over here may have been useful in terms of them being able to remind the medical professional of the legislation and this woman's rights in terms of their breaching the Equality Act and their human rights by acting in a discriminatory manner, and that's my belief. But they thought um, that this lady's behaviour may be difficult, may be tricky, okay, let's go away, just give her some more medication, let's sedate her, she's got carers around her and let's leave her, we'll come back tomorrow and see how she is. I don't think that would have happened someone without a learning disability to bring their own home in the community or an older person who has a full capacity. Um, so I think maybe a native social worker would have been able to employ some pressure when it comes to the legislation and the responsibility that needs to be placed on medical professionals to respond appropriately. Sorry. I think that's a really good point. The coroner, interestingly, went on to say to... Uh, the coroner went on to say this kind of summing up of the concern that the concern is that a person not having such learning difficulties who was able to express themselves might have received more timely treatment and could have survived. So there, there definitely was uh, inequality here, wasn't there? Yes. Real definitely. inequality. Okay, another point here, and then I think the gentleman down at the front. I agree with one social worker, one person, that's fabulous. In reality, that's very hard to achieve. However, at the point of review, somebody who had a proper review and their medical needs and history recorded correctly, then the ideal route would be through the community learning disability team who would do um, a hospital passport, who should do a crisis plan, um, which should have been used by the support staff, by the management of that service. And of course, one of the massive missed points of this is not contacting the family sooner enough because for this lady, she had professional family members around her who could have forced probably better medical intervention to happen in a more timely fashion, which may have saved her life. I don't necessarily think that role of one's name social worker is the answer, because basically what this is looking for is a coordinator. And that's not necessarily a social worker's task. This is a health issue. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, we'll take this final point from this gentleman at the front. Oh. There was a named professional involved here. It was the GP, and it was the GP's professional uh, responsibility to have that curiosity. Why are we not talking about what the GP did or did not do, rather than suggesting that it should be a social worker's role to, to coordinate a health response? Just don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that it should be a social worker. The question is really, what could a social worker uh, the role of added here, you know, what was the, the opportunity, I guess. But it's not what's on the that, it's about what professionals aren't doing, that they should be doing. 
Yeah. So there's something about for me about the um, about us all acting as advocates, really strong advocates. I've heard that word used so many times today, but it's so essential, isn't it? When we see something not happening for somebody, it's not just the advocacy organisation's job. It's everybody's job. Families are uh, amazing advocates, professionals, all professionals can act as advocates. We're going to take a question down the front here, and we're going to move on to our findings. Okay. Just out of my hands, I was going to say, but basically, uh, what we discussed <laughs> is that um, having one main social worker could um, cause more serious case abuse in the future if that's what we were relying on as social workers. Uh, and to reiterate the point that it, it's sort of the better social work and the way of practicing is that a team to have those skills there and those communication skills, those advocacy skills, uh, advocacy skills and professional curiosity that um, we, we'd sort of work with that situation. Whereas if there was one named social worker, if they were off sick or they was in the road crisis in the personal lives, because we are humans, we're not robots, we can't be everywhere, um, there's, a, there's a huge risk um, of possibly future serious case abuse if it was, was implemented. Good points, well made. Right, I'm going to move on to our recommendations and findings uh, from the report. So, um, th these were some of the things that we identified with the problems with this situation. So, medical, rec uh, medical record access <laughs> must be improved. So, there was no access to the medical records out of hours. So, these doctors that were coming and working in a very episodic way, um, they didn't know the history. They were dealing with what, what did they see in front of them at that particular moment. So, so one of our recommendations was that, that, that uh, access to medical records should be improved. The reflagging system. Now, interestingly enough, the SIPOLD review made many of the same recommendations that we made. So had they been correctly implemented in 2013 when, when the report was written, uh, the SIPOLD report, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation now because actually a number of the recommendations are absolutely the same. So yeah. a flagging system yeah. should be in place to identify to healthcare professionals those that may need reasonable adjustment because here it, you know, it didn't appear like reasonable adjustment was been made. There's a couple of times, wasn't there? You know, let's get some sedation, that could be seen as a reasonable adjustment. Let's get the ambulance to take her directly to the ward rather than through A&E, yeah, but there, could, there was more yeah. opportunities for that throughout yeah. this situation. Um, a register of people with learning difficulties should be available out of hours. So one of the things that Cumbria has really struggled with for quite some time now is about getting all of our kind of statutory organisations speaking to each other in terms of computer systems. I don't know whether that's improved at all uh, yet, but certainly I'm seeing some shaking of heads at the back of the room. <laughs> so, so clearly, there's still a real disconnect between the agencies in terms of the information that's available. Um, we suggested that healthcare services should audit their reasonable adjustments. What's the menu of reasonable adjustments available to them? How are they using them? You know, what could be done differently? And does everybody know that those things could happen? A named healthcare coordinator should be allocated to people with complex and multiple needs. That was a sideboard recommendation, it wasn't ours. It just needs to happen. Yeah. Um, mental capacity, this is, I said we'd talk about mental capacity. So we had a few, we, there was lots of issues we felt around mental capacity here. So mental capacity training should be provided to GPs. Uh, we found an absolute lack of understanding about the Mental Capacity Act. Mental capacity training should be mandatory for healthcare staff. And advice around mental capacity should be available out of hours. And um, so when we asked that question, we were told, of course, it's available. You know, we have a duty social work team and they know. Well, we found that not good enough, really. We thought that, that you know, just having a, a, a duty social worker with some knowledge about, uh, a, a, about mental capacity what wasn't enough uh, and that more knowledge needed to be available or that person needed to have extra additional training. We thought that people with learning difficulties should hold, hold their own um, personal health records. So that's the first thing, and that happens, doesn't it? But also people should know to ask for them, which didn't happen. Nobody asked for that information. Uh, so it was available, it's no good. It's like personal centre planning donkeys years ago, isn't it? You know, lovely files sat in offices, 
in the bottom of filing cabinet drawers. Yeah, no bleeping, people, a damn bit of noise. But if people don't them. know um, that it's to be used, then, I mean, you don't know what you don't know, basically. Yeah, so, so staff, in particular medical professionals, should know to ask for these things. This is one of the worst bits for me throughout the whole review. Um, Judy received, so how many days was she in pain? About four or five days, crying out in pain, screaming out. And what did she get? I told you. What was she given? Two paracetamols. Yes. I mean, it's just disgraceful. It's absolutely disgraceful. We've got somebody crying out in pain. She couldn't walk, she couldn't move, and we gave her two bloody paracetamols. It's a disgrace. So one of our findings was yes. that pain assessment yes. protocol should be put in place. Mm -hmm. And it was a really interesting one. We've worked with the safeguarding board to understand, well, what is that? What is a pain assessment for somebody who doesn't verbally communicate? How do you carry it out? Uh, there's a number of tools available, but they're all big and clunky and difficult to use, and they don't necessarily get to the core issue. But also, whose responsibility was it to carry out an assessment of pain? And there's an argument that it's a number of people's all the way through this journey should have been assessing the pain. Yeah. But actually nobody did. You know, the district nurse said give her two paracetamol. Or give her paracetamol. And that was only administered twice. So you could say, yeah. did the service, you know, were they looking at the needs again? Were they providing enough support at that time? Okay, we also said uh, that staff should feel able to contact the LD nursing team whenever they need help and advice. So as we were talking to the care, care workers, they just didn't feel like that. It was like a last resort rather than the first port of call. Yeah. And in our view, you know, when dealing with the health of somebody, it should be something that people should feel absolutely like they can just pick up the phone and do what you described, which is just have conversations really easily and openly. That an emergency health care plan should be put in place. Uh, another one of our findings was that carers often know the most about individuals and they must be empowered to advocate strongly. So, you know, we, we go in, we meet a person, we often don't know very much about them. But some of Judy's staff, one of the members of staff that was with her in hospital when she died had known her for 20 years. They'd been with her and supporting her for 20 years. So, we, yeah. you know, they absolutely knew what she needed. Um, but they didn't feel empowered. They didn't have the skills necessary to advocate really strongly. Um, and one of our findings was that, that you know, support agencies should be supporting their staff to really become amazing advocates for people. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and the pro professionals should know to listen to that information. Because it's, it's okay being able to advocate for somebody, but if nobody's listening, if the GP in the middle of the night that's the on-call doctor is not listening to the carers saying, I mean, they, they were saying, um, the staff that came to the day were saying, we were telling them something, this was not right. She was really unwell, we'd never seen her like this. They were, they were saying those things, but they just weren't believed. No. So clearly, we need, uh, we need more kind of importance placed on the voice of carers. Mm -hmm. So, I think that's more or less, um, that they were our findings. They've been kind of, uh, they've currently been rolled out. What's really interesting for us has been an outside organisation is that it's really difficult to kind of track yeah. what's happening and what's, hap what, what's not happening across agencies. Yeah. Um, I'm going to raise a concern from my point of view, from a, an independent organisation's point of view. It's no good that we just tick some boxes and say that we've got a little bit of evidence that a little bit of training's happened with some GPs in a 20 minute session once a year. Yeah. That's not how learning is disseminated. We need to have lots of conversations like this. And that's why we're trying to kind of take the story of Judy Ben out there and tell everybody about it. So we'll take any questions that you've got before yeah. we wrap up. David, is your email address correct? No. <laughs> Peoplefirstcumbria.co.uk. Thank you. Okay. Oh. And they, she thinks that they know she's blind because of the way they're acting, but 
they do that with everyone. It's the protocol to make people understand the process. And then when it comes to the end, because you've boiled up now, they say, oh, and if you just, this will tell you the results. And she said, but I'm blind. And they said, well, get someone to read it to you. And she, she chokes at this point. She says, why should someone else, even my husband, know before I know? I need to make that choice. And that's when people get it. Mm -hmm. So people in the room suddenly wake up. Because when they see what happens to real people, like this lady, that's what brings them back. Yes. I think the, the these kind of stories are really powerful. That's why yeah, I wanted to sell it. They are. Uh, over here, first table. I was actually the first in the room that was involved with the reviews. I just wanted to point out that the review was actually a really good person says it was a stroke. Um, I'm not going to give any credit that. And the main point of the review was actually on the jury, Judy Light, who was a positive person. That was the start of the start of the review. I think that really set the tone for what the day was about. It wasn't, it wasn't about the day, it wasn't about um, <coughs> health against social. It was about what happened to Judy, making it personal to her. People realise that we're involved in what needs to happen to make improvements. I think mean, David Wright was the next step to, to send them down and not those improvements, which may or may not have happened yet, but I think uh, yeah, it, was, it was a really positive day for me. Mm, thanks for saying that. Challenging day was a difficult story to listen to, but I think it all left that room with the other steps that I need to be taken. Yeah. One of the things that we insisted upon was that people involved in the review, uh, we asked two, two types of people. People who knew Judy and had met her. So every organisation had to send somebody that, that had actually treated Judy because the first round of people that we were offered from the organisations were slightly PR ish, if you get my drift. Um, so we kind of wrote back to everybody and said, actually, we want people who've met her and we want then that person's uh, decision maker, you know, who, somebody who can actually implement some change as a result of the review. Yeah. And I'm really pleased to say that we got lots of commitment from the organisation. We did. The only organisation that weren't able to attend was, was an office ambulance service. Yeah. Uh, and since that, I went to meet with them and kind of shared the learning with them as well. So. Yeah. And like GPs come, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. GP. Okay. Any other points before we finish our questions? Thank you. I've got copies of the report. Yeah. Uh, so come and grab me. Uh, now I haven't got enough for everybody. I'm sorry. Um, but we can certainly make sure that we email out the report. Yeah. Can we you please take it with you. And yes. please talk to your team and your colleagues and yes. tell them this story because there's lots of learning in the report. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.